Hi, my name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. Hello, humans. Today, I am going to be answering some dog training questions that have come down the pipeline. If you have a question you'd like answered in a future Q&A episode, you can uh, find us on uh, Instagram at School for the Dogs. You can send a direct message or go to anniegrossman.com slash ask, and you'll find a nifty little form there. So our first question comes through Instagram from um, a listener named B. She writes, Hi, Annie. I've just finished listening to your crate training episode. I love how no-nonsense you are with most subjects, and this one is of particular interest to me. My husband and I fostered a few dogs before we adopted. All the dogs we had before, including puppies and adults, slept in a crate. However, our last foster, a now adopted member of the family, hates the crate. He'll go in if there is food, but if the door closes, he immediately loses it and won't eat. He tries to eat the bars, jump up, jumps up and throws himself against the bars, and generally cries until you open the door. We've also tried pens, etc. We want to create train for all the reasons you mentioned on the podcast and also because I want him to stop sleeping in our bed. He moves around and I'm always scared he'll fall off. He was rescued from a puppy mill uh, and I've been following the best friends guidelines which say that some dogs will never adapt to crates after being born in a puppy mill. He is five months old. He also hates pens. I've tried covering the crate to make it more den-like but he barks and jumps the whole time. Occasionally, he goes quiet. I've even filmed him and left the apartment, and he keeps jumping and barking until I'm back. He is very happy when he's let out. He also won't eat if he knows he's closed in the pen or crate. He's very stuck to me in general. If I leave the room, he follows me. He scratches at the door or the bathroom if I'm in there. I want him to feel confident and comfortable in our home, and I think crate training would help him, but overall, he just seems very unsure. He goes to daycare and is fine being cared for by others. It seems that he is perfectly happy as long as he isn't alone. Is there any hope for him or for us? Okay, so first of all, B mentions that her puppy is only five months old. And let's remember, five months, it might be towards the end of uh, a puppy's socialization period, which we really think starts to end around 12 weeks. But dogs are always learning, and 20 weeks is still a very young puppy, so don't lose hope about anything just yet. All of that said, I suggest picking and choosing your battles to some extent here, and unless it's absolutely necessary to be leaving your dog in a crate, or really leaving your dog at all perhaps, um, I wouldn't uh, stress too much about trying to get him acclimated to being in a crate and being alone and being alone in a crate. I do think there are lots of benefits to crate training, but I also think you can have a really great dog who doesn't use a crate. I actually never taught my dog to use a crate. He has been in a crate, he can go in a crate, um, but I very, very rarely had to leave him in a crate for any reason, and uh, it really hasn't been an issue in our lives together. I just didn't really know about crate training when I uh, first got him, and by the time I eventually started learning about dog training and then became a professional dog trainer and understood how uh, useful crates could be, uh, I just didn't see a great need for it as far as his training went. So all of that is to say that crates are great for many reasons, but you can have a well-trained dog and not use a crate, and in some situations for some dogs that might be preferable. And if a dog is dealing with any kind of anxiety, which might be anxiety about being alone or being confined, I certainly would rather first focus on that issue and then think about how we can get them interested in both being in a crate and being in a crate alone. Now, whenever a dog has any kind of separation issues, or even if a dog doesn't, uh, I think it's still 
wise to get a dog used to the idea that good stuff happens when you're around. And usually uh, that means I suggest feeding your dog when you leave. And that might just be you leaving the room, going into the hallway, going into the bathroom. Uh, But if a dog can't handle that, it might just mean turning your back on the dog or feed when you're not paying attention to the dog. Uh, If a dog is too stressed to eat when you leave the room, that's certainly not a good sign. And a super stressed dog is not a dog that's going to be doing very much learning. So we want to figure out what your dog can handle. And if all he can handle is you turning your back on him while he's eating, then that's a good place to start. My reasoning to this whole idea of feeding the dog and then going out of sight is rooted in my suspicion that your dog already has lots of good associations with being around you. Lots of good things in your dog's life clearly happen when you're around. And when your dog is eating, your dog is forging associations and learning to associate good things with whatever's going on during mealtime. If your dog, again, if your dog is able to eat. If your dog is too stressed to eat, it's a different story. But if your dog is eating and you're there, he's pairing the food with you. Gosh, my human is awesome. Food always appears when she is around. And we want to change that into, gosh, it's awesome when the door closes behind my human because that's when food appears. Now, if you also want to try and get your dog to feel good about the crate, you can pair food with the crate, and you have the opportunity to do that at every mealtime. Now, I understand what you're saying, that the dog is stressed out in the crate and is just focusing on getting out of the crate once he's in there. So I suggest uh, putting the food in the crate but leaving the crate open and seeing if your dog can handle that. I would also suggest feeding in some kind of toy which will slow down your dog's eating and just extend the amount of time your dog is eating in the crate, which is extending the amount of time your dog is making associations between food and crate. Also, if your dog likes the toy, that is only going to further help the associations your dog is making. I suggest the topple, which is uh, kind of like a Kong-style toy. It's a toy you stuff food into. And uh, because the crate sounds like it is a source of stress for your dog, I would make sure that you're feeding extra delicious meals in the crate. So if you're giving dry food, you might switch to wet food. Um, I always suggest... uh, frozen or dehydrated wet foods like Evermore or Stella and Chewy's and um, fill the topple, which kind of looks like a, sort of like a thimble shaped rubber toy. But what I particularly like about it is it has a hole on the side so you could zip tie the topple into the back of the crate. That way your dog can't just go into the crate and uh, take it out and um, See, see how that goes. Now, I would not suggest uh, closing the door. I want the door to, to, be, to be open. And also, because we don't want to stress your dog out really in any way, uh, you also don't want to start doing trials of leaving at first um, because that would probably be asking too much of your dog. So you could start out at a meal putting the topple in the back of the crate, stuffing it with something more delicious than his regular meals, and stay near the crate. And uh, if that seems to be easy for your dog, then you can just start walking around the room while your dog is eating his meals. And you could do this every meal. When that seems easy and your dog doesn't seem overly stressed out about you walking around, you might start just very briefly going out of sight. Again, I don't want to stress your dog out even a single time. I think when you're dealing with a dog who has any kind of separation distress, it's like they're having a panic attack when they go into their crazy headspace, and ideally we never want them to have another panic attack again. We shouldn't be like 
pushing them to to the limit at any point. We always want to be hovering below that that threshold. So that could just be like ducking under the kitchen counter <laughs> for 10 seconds or five seconds, uh, just briefly, briefly going out of sight. I also really love using the treat and train for this kind of work. If you're not familiar with the treat and train, we do carry it at storeforthedogs.com. It's a remote controlled treat dispenser. Um, there are a lot of uh, high tech, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, video camera kind of versions of the treat and train now, treat and train now available, but uh, the treat and train. Uh, doesn't have any of those uh, nifty features, but it is my favorite um, d- treat dispenser of any kind for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that um, you can take off the kind of like lip that normally sits on its bottom and put the whole thing on top of the crate and then fill it with dry food or treats, or I even like to use, sometimes I'll use peanuts or Cheerios, anything kind of dry and small. And um, If you sit the whole thing on top of the crate, treats can just uh, drop into the crate. So the way I would use that in the kind of situation you're talking about, again, put the dog in the crate, but don't close the crate and fill it with some treats that are going to be able to be used with the treat and train, something your dog really likes, and start triggering it as you're walking around the apartment. Um, If your dog leaves the crate, that's okay. Uh, He's probably going to run back in when he hears the treats dropping into the crate. Um, When that gets really easy, again, you can start triggering it when you duck behind a door or duck into the bathroom or that kind of thing. Again, making the association for your dog, oh, good things happen in the crate. Treats fall in the crate when my human is briefly out of sight. Now, in uh, the recent episode um, I did about dog crates, Uh, specifically about the Revel dog crate. Um, I mentioned that uh, I like dog crates that are as, like, open as possible, the kind of just ones that have metal bars that a dog can see through very easily instead of the more enclosed plastic kind of crate. And the reason is that I think it's nice if a dog can feel still like he's part of what's going on in the room when he's in the crate, as opposed to feeling separated. And I also like uh, these sort of more open wire kinds of crates because you can do training with the dog while the dog is in the crate, which is, again, only going to help your dog feel good about being in the crate because your dog's going to be spending time with you and your dog's going to be getting treats in the crate. And uh, actually, there's lots of training that you can do with a dog in a crate that um works really well because your dog doesn't have a whole lot of choices of things to do. So for instance, if you wanted to click every time your dog sits in a crate, you're going to probably get a lot of sits or click every time your dog lies down, you're going to get a lot of downs because your dog's not going to be wandering all over the place. Um, I've even taught dogs to spin in a crate. Um, A hand touch is a really easy thing to work on with that kind of crate. And I usually suggest uh, selecting a crate that's not a whole lot bigger than your dog. You want your dog to be able to turn around and lie down in a crate, but I usually suggest not getting a very large one, especially if you're dealing with house training issues, because one of the great things about using a crate is dogs don't usually want to hang out where they pee and poop, so a dog is usually more inclined to uh, hold their pee and poop when they're in a crate. So it can help you figure out when they're going to need to pee and poop because as soon as you let your dog out of the crate, you can whisk your dog outside and uh, give them an elimination opportunity. However, you mentioned uh, that your dog may have come from a puppy mill. And yes, I think it's true that dogs who come from puppy mills or that are in pet stores sometimes, especially, you know, during those those early early weeks of puppyhood sometimes can develop severe averse reactions to being confined, especially being confined in something um, that is uh, like a metal cage, if that's perhaps what they were in early on. You know, also people often don't think about it, but many dogs are transported at the age of 
six, seven, eight weeks old, uh, right after being taken from their their mothers and their siblings, and sometimes they're put on planes or on very long car rides. And um, that can be super stressful for many dogs and can certainly leave them with a, a deep-seated fear of being confined in anything that's cage-like. So I would actually suggest going big and getting a large crate for your dog so almost like it's like he's going to have his own room. And if he's been having bad experiences in the crate that you have, um, I, you didn't tell me exactly what the size is or what the style is, but whatever the size or style, probably not a bad idea to start fresh with a completely new crate so that you can have a spot that's um, like a, a, a clean slate. But I would get <coughs> a crate that's as big as possible, which, to be honest, might not help with housebreaking and using a crate for housebreaking, house training reasons. Um, but it's going to be a while before I would want you to be leaving your dog in the crate alone with the door closed anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, and once your dog is happy and comfortable in his large studio apartment <laughs> style crate or whatever your apartment, whatever size your apartment can, can accommodate, um, you eventually could probably go smaller without too much stress. I also have recently seen, and I haven't uh, seen one of these in person, but I've seen them online, these like acrylic crates that, or pens um, that are kind of walled off clear areas that you can buy on Etsy. There's a, there are some crates of this style made by a shop called Pretty Kennels. I'll link to it in the show notes. They are pretty pricey, but I like this idea of a, a totally clear see-through crate that has no kinds of bars. Um, and then there's also, they, they, this other company looks like they have more like pens than crates, but similar idea, pretty cool, um, and more affordably priced, slightly more affordably priced. They're still pretty expensive, but uh, the shop is called Clearly Loved Pets, and they have these crates called Lucidium that are made of acrylic and uh, aluminum, and stainless steel and look like, um, yeah, kind of like <laughs> these mini, mini apartments that you can put uh, your dog in that I think would probably be big enough even for you to hang out in there with your dog, which is uh, a great way to try and acclimate your dog to being in this, this new space. Now, like I said earlier, if you don't want to use a crate at all, that's also totally fine. But you still are going to want to try and build your dog's confidence uh, during the times when you can't be around because certainly you can't be with your dog every moment of every day. And in order to do that, I would go back to thinking about what I think of as the four W's of feeding your dog, where, when, what, and who. In journalism, of course, there's a fifth W, which is why, but we, we know why you're feeding your dog. Anyway, we talked about where you're feeding your dog. Uh, in this case, I would be feeding him in the crate. Uh, we talked about when we're going to feed him, when you're leaving or when you're sort of pretend leaving in order to create a good association with your departures. Now, who is going to feed your dog? I suggest that you have, whenever possible, someone other than you feeding your dog. Again, it's all about creating associations and the more we can help your dog feel good, have good associations with people other than you, the less super attached your dog is likely to be specifically to you because he's more likely to feel like, oh, okay, my human's not around, but that's fine. There are other people who can uh, help take care of me, which brings me to the what you're going to feed your dog. And I'm not talking about what kind of food. I, I know I spoke a little bit about that and suggested my go-to types of food, but certainly uh, you're going to make a personal choice about what you want to feed your dog. But instead of thinking about the kind of food you're going to feed him, uh, I think this what question should be more about what you're going to feed your dog in. How are you going to feed your dog? 
And again, I'd really suggest you consider using the treat and train and uh, different kinds of work to eat toys. If you've listened to this podcast before, you certainly know that I am a big fan of work to eat toys. But In this case, it's not just about helping your dog expend energy and keeping your dog occupied and making meal times last longer, although those are all benefits of work-to-eat toys. In this case, it's really about building your dog's confidence and helping him figure out that he can sort of take care of himself. Or in the case of the treat and train, that if he's alone, the machine is going to take care of him. So... To talk about the treat and train in this situation, I kind of think of it like uh, Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. If you ever watched that cartoon, you will remember that Rosie was the nanny, and she was also a robot, but the parents left the kids alone with Rosie, and you can imagine the kids felt safe, even though Rosie wasn't their parent and Rosie wasn't even a human. And um, that's sort of how I think of the treat and train. I want your dog to funnel some of his feelings of, oh, I'm okay, I'm being taken care of, I'm being provided for onto this inanimate object. I want him to feel like, oh, mom is gone, but that's fine because the treat and train is here to feed me and take care of me. And as ridiculous as this might sound... Just take a moment to think about how much people do love objects, and objects make people feel safe and happy, Um, whether that's uh, the way someone feels about their car or the way a little kid might feel about a special teddy bear or blanket. It's possible to use an object to help your dog develop a sense of safety and security, especially if it's an object that you could be controlling secretly from the other room and that is literally dispensing food for your dog. Of course, you don't have to be in the other room to control it. You could be controlling it from the same room, even with uh, you visible to your dog. The food is still coming out of the treat and train. And other kinds of work-to-eat toys, like I mentioned the topple before, but other kinds of toys I think can serve a, a slightly different but equally important purpose of making your dog feel like he can take care of himself. And I'm thinking about toys that your dog really has to work at. I I love Nina Odison toys. Uh, The Casino is a great one. The Brick is another really good one. We have these at Store for the Dogs or in our shop on East 7th Street. And they really require effort and time and a degree of problem solving for your dog to get to their food. And the toys I mentioned are ones that you can use with wet food, dry food, um, raw food, I even often will freeze my dog's food in these toys to make them extra hard. There's certainly the benefit of giving this kind of toy to your dog when you're leaving because it is going to occupy your dog and burn a lot of energy, and by the time your dog finishes the toy, um, the sadness of you leaving will probably have dissipated because... 10 or 20 minutes may have passed. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you leave your dog with uh, a toy like this at this point. Like I said, if your dog is too stressed to eat when you leave, I wouldn't leave just yet. I might just, you know, suggest you be on the other side of the room or have your back turned towards your dog or walk quickly out of the room and back into the room while your dog is eating. But The idea of giving a toy uh, like this is that I want your dog to feel like I did that. I fed myself, I scavenged, I problem solved, and I am capable of taking care of myself. I know it sounds sort of silly, but I really want your dog to have that sense of uh, accomplishment. Rather than just thinking uh, I'm totally dependent on my human to place a bowl down in front of me. I think we can use these kinds of toys to build this sort of sense of self-sufficiency. And it doesn't just have to be about the toys. You could do something similar by hiding treats or bully sticks or even your dog's meals around your house. Um, If you don't want random food under your couch and uh, your 
dining table, you could dribble some dry food in a towel or uh, get like one of those stringy mop heads even and hide some food in one of those and put those in in a corner for your dog to find. For more on dealing with separation issues, I highly recommend a book called Treating Separation Anxiety in Dogs by Milena DiMartini Price. And also the book I'll Be Home Soon by Patricia McConnell. I think both of these books are filled with uh, great tips and protocol for dealing with teaching your dog to be alone, whether or not you're having a serious separation issue, separation anxiety or isolation distress Puppies certainly need to learn to be alone, and like you said, different puppies from different situations, whether it be from a shelter or a pet store or who knows, might uh, have different issues with being left alone. And I think following some of the steps in these books from the get-go can really help your dog learn that being alone is okay and can help stave off behavioral issues before they ever get to the point of having to call in a professional trainer to work with. In fact, when I've had uh, stressed out dog owners uh, (coughs) contact me about their dogs who have separation issues but who are worried about spending the money on a trainer, uh, I've often told them to go and read and work through the steps in Milena DiMartini Price's book because she outlines very clearly the steps that a trainer is going to want to work through with a client and a client's dog as well. I think it can be super useful to work with a trainer if you are dealing with serious separation anxiety with your dog, both because a trainer can diagnose how serious the issue is, and also because it can be helpful to have a trainer really be like a coach to do some hand-holding and to encourage you to keep going uh, during what can sometimes be a long and slow and difficult process. But if you don't have the luxury of working with a trainer, uh, It's certainly something that you can deal with on your own, and these books are a great, great place to start. Okay, our next question touches on actually some similar issues. Hi, Annie. Uh, My name is Supriya Iyer. I live in Portland, Oregon with my dog, Finn. Um, I had a question this might be a little long but um first of all i love your podcast uh yours is the only dog related podcast i listen to because it's so informative and i love how precise and and thoroughly you describe everything um anyway yeah so thanks for making this podcast so my question is that i'm currently in a psychology class and we're learning about developmental psychology um currently reading about attachment styles in infants uh, secure versus insecure attachment, that sort of thing. And it got me thinking that my dog, uh, Finn, does not really play with other dogs when I'm not around. So at daycare, on the dog cams, I don't see him playing with other dogs. And when my neighbor comes to check on Finn with his dog when I'm at school or at work, um, he doesn't really play with the other dog. I mean, he'll go out to pee and stuff, but he doesn't really get excited to see the other dog, even though he loves playing with, with that dog when I'm around. Um, so does, I guess my question is, does attachment theory apply to dogs? And, um, maybe this is related, but is there a way I can get Finn to play with other dogs when I'm not around? Um, I, I think it seems like he may be securely attached if I'm reading my textbook right. And sometimes that's a great thing, but maybe in this case it has sort of an unfortunate consequence. So, um, yeah, anyway, thank you very much. And, um, I hope to hear an answer from you. Really excellent question. And if you would like to call and ask me a question on voicemail, you may do so at 917-414-2625. Or if you have the Anchor app, you can leave a message there. Anyway, so attachment theory is not something I was very familiar with. 
uh, although I had heard of it, and I had also heard the term attachment parenting, um, but that too was something I didn't really know very much about, but uh, having recently become a mom, I was interested to learn a little bit about it, and this question um, gave me the opportunity to learn about both attachment theory and attachment parenting and uh, what they have to do with each other. And I was kind of surprised to learn what they have to do with uh, how good dog trainers approach dog training. I mean, I guess that's not that surprising since I'm constantly seeing similarities in uh, the way we deal with people and the way we should be dealing with dogs, um, since after all, we are all are animals, especially we all are mammals. Um, but I'd never heard people refer to attachment uh, in the way the caller does when it comes to dog training, although I think uh, there are other terms that we do use to describe um, similar phenomena. But before I get into the kind of nerdier side of things, I want to give some quick suggestions and thoughts. So first of all, it's very common for a dog to not want to play with other dogs when his or her human isn't around. In fact, one time I was at a conference and um, there was a panel about uh, multi-dog households and one of the panelists asked the audience of several hundred dog trainers, who here has dogs who play when uh, they aren't around. And I guess enough people have uh, like nanny cam kind of things now that they can spy on their dogs when they're not around. And out of this room of uh, a few hundred dog trainers, I guess first they asked who here has uh, households with more than one dog. And I don't know, a few, a few dozen people <laughs> raised their hands, and then when they said, okay, now like only, only keep your hand raised if your dogs play when you're not around, almost nobody kept their hand raised. And anecdotally, I know that it's often the same thing with toys. Some dogs, I would say many dogs, don't play with their toys or chew toys or anything unless their person is around. And this can be the case even if you have a dog that is super comfortable with um, the other dog that he or she is with in the case of households with multiple dogs. And this can also be the case when uh, the dog is super comfortable with another person that's around. Uh, if it's not their primary person, they still might not be interested in playing. Um, I was talking t about this to our... Um, former trainer Anna Marie, and she mentioned our French Bulldog students, Gilby and Ghost, who met at School for the Dogs, and they play all the time with each other at each other's apartments. They're totally best friends, and um, their their moms will often Instagram their playdates in stories, and when you watch their little Instagram videos, you can see that every now and then, when they're at one or the other's house, um, one of their moms might leave, and the playing changes noticeably. The two dogs might interact, and I wouldn't say that either one seems overwhelmingly distressed at all, but uh, if they're at Ghost's house and Alex, who is Gilby's owner, leaves, You'll often see Gilby kind of eyeing the door, and if they're at Gilby's house and Ghost's owner Tiffany pops out, you'll see Ghost might kind of drop out of play. But if both Alex and Tiffany are around, Gilby and Ghost can't get enough of each other. And these are both very healthy, well-rounded, I would say pretty happy uh, dogs without major behavioral issues. So I think if you're seeing that your dog isn't that interested in playing with other dogs when you're not around, wouldn't worry too much about it. I think it's pretty normal. All of that said, I think it's also worth thinking about the fact that it can be very hard for dogs to negotiate new social setups. 
And I think often when we put a dog in daycare, we're asking a lot of them. We're not only asking that a dog tolerate um, being away from uh, his or her main human, but we're also asking the dog to navigate a whole new group of dogs because very rarely at a daycare do you find the same grouping of dogs one day to the next, which is one thing I don't really love about daycares. There's a there is a daycare near School for the Dogs called Rough Club, and they charge a yearly fee that they call like a membership fee, which on the one hand I think is a little gimmicky because it's sort of billing, they try and bill themselves as like a social club, but on the other hand I think it's smart because if you're paying an annual fee, you're more inclined to send your dog there regularly, and they, the, the, the dog daycare, is less likely to have people just sort of dropping in. And we actually kind of do a similar thing with our membership at School for the Dogs for our schoolyard, which is our trainer-supervised dog run. Um, it's not like dog care, dog daycare um, in that we don't let people just leave their dogs with us. The owner has to be there with their dog. It's a little bit more like a dog run. Um, but rather than a dog run having random dogs in it, which is, again, kind of like the daycare situation, um, our schoolyard has a limited number of dogs in the, because it's only for our members who also pay a monthly or a yearly fee. So the dogs who come tend to get to know each other and really do develop these sort of like friendships. So I suggest, you know, you just kind of make peace with the fact that your dog might never love playing with other dogs in your absence as much as he's going to love playing with other dogs when you're around. But try and arrange play sessions for your dog with dogs that he is comfortable with rather than putting him in situations like at a daycare or, or a, a dog run where he's going to have to um, find new friends each time. And you can uh, try and pay as little attention to your dog as possible in these situations. So I think that might help your dog become a little bit more comfortable playing when you are not super engaged. I say that, of course, you know, another benefit of having dogs your dog knows and has sort of figured out how to interact with is you can breathe a little bit easier knowing that you're not, your dog is not going to uh, most likely get into some sort of altercation with an unknown dog, which um, I always worry about at the dog park. Uh, where there are just so many, so many variables and um, dogs and uh, people who you don't know. I mean, again, it's not so different um, than with anyone else. Like, I would much rather socialize with a bunch of friends than uh, hang out every night at um, you know a bar where I don't know anyone. That's why people go to the same bar over and over because you get to know the people. Or a kid, right? Like a kid. Uh, is probably going to learn to make friends and be away from his mom or dad at a daycare where it's the same group of kids every day than if you just dropped the kid off at a playground where there are new kids every time you go and also dropping your child off at a playground is <laughs> probably a bad idea. Anyway, um, Let's go into a little bit about what I learned in my uh, effort to educate myself a bit on uh, attachment theory and also on attachment parenting. I found a really interesting website that's called evolutionaryparenting.com. It's the website of um, Dr. Tracy Cassells, and I'm actually just going to read a little bit from her site because I thought it explained things pretty well. I'll link to the full page in the show notes. I'm abridging a little bit here, but Cassells writes, Attachment theory began with John Bowlby and was continued in his work with Mary Ainsworth as a theory describing the types of relationships that exist between child and caregiver. It has also been extended to refer to all of our relationships with individuals, but the focus has remained on the parent-child attachment relationship, most likely due to the extreme importance of this initial relationship. 
As a bit of history, the theory began when Bowlby was asked to study orphaned infants and children after World War II who presented with myriad problems, socially, emotionally, and cognitively, and he determined that the cause of these problems stemmed from a lack of maternal involvement. Now we know that time now we know with time that it's not all about mom, that so long as infants have an attachment with a primary caregiver, they will have the tools to develop in a healthy manner. There have been over the years four different types of attachment parent patterns that we can see between infant and parent secure, avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. Secure attachment is what we strive for and is characterized by a child showing some distress when separated from their parent, happiness at their return, and a generalized preference for their parents over others. Avoidant attachment is characterized by a lack of preference for the parent over other strangers. These children rarely seek out their parents for comfort. Anxious attachment is characterized by distress when separated from the parent, but a lack of comfort upon the parent's return and may in fact be quite hostile towards the parent upon returning. Finally, disorganized attachment is characterized by a mixture of avoidant and anxious behaviors. The final three attachment patterns cluster together under the term insecure attachment. Although not all children with insecure attachments will develop later psychopathologies or generalized problems, the likelihood that they do is far greater than for children with secure attachments. So how do we get our child to be securely attached? Isn't that the question most parents want to answer? Well, in one sense, the answer is incredibly easy. Respond to your child. But what that means opens up a whole other debate, and this is where attachment parenting seems to come into play. Bowlby, in his initial research, believed that early attachment was fostered in environments like those of historic and modern hunter-gatherer societies. These societies, as I have focused on here on environmentalparenting.com, shared many premises with what is termed attachment parenting and what has been studied with respect to moral development and infant outcomes. Infants in these societies are typically breastfed on demand, held close to a parent nearly all the time, are responded to immediately when they cry. Birth is a natural event free of interventions and babies are immediately given to mom post-birth and infants sleep close to their caregivers. In Bowlby's view, this type of behavior fostered immediate response and responsiveness, and thus attachment. So what is the real premise of attachment theory and attachment parenting? It's responsiveness. It's listening to your child and responding to his or her needs. And early in life, all your child has are needs. As your child ages, there will be wants mixed in, but believe it or not, most things that will cause them distress will be needs. And in this, we must remember that their needs will be very different from our own, and we must not place adult expectations of what they can and cannot handle on our children. Okay, so I'm done reading now. This is me talking again. Um, So interesting. So what I think is so interesting about this as it relates to dog training is that it is uh, very similar to what I think about how we should be treating puppies. Um, I've taught lots of puppies. I've taught lots of puppy owners. I've taught many puppy kindergarten classes. And I'm always stressing to puppy owners, I mean, dog owners in general, but specifically puppy owners, that we really need to first think about how a puppy is feeling, how we can get them to feel good about the world we are asking them to live in. In my view, it is so much more important to think about the associations a puppy is making with everything around him before we start asking the puppy to do things. I call it criteria zero. It's focusing on the classical conditioning. How can I just make my dog feel good about something rather than, and basically rewarding my dog for doing nothing is what it's going to look like to others before I start rewarding him for doing specific things that I want. The behavior I want is just at the beginning is just the behavior of existing in this room. You're, you're here in this room with these new people, with this person with a beard or a funny hat or whatever. Good job. Here's a treat. Too often with dogs, we think about, well, a trained dog is a dog that can sit or leave it or drop it or do whatever number of things you want to check off a list. And uh, I've seen that so many times when people come into like a puppy kindergarten class and even, you know, before class has started, they're trying to get their dog to sit or they're trying to get their dog to lie down. And I'll come over and I'll say, you know, Bella, be cute good job. (laughs) Stanley exist. Nice work. Give a treat, right? Because 
at that stage of life, we want the dog to just feel good about showing up in that room. Um, and we, we often fail to think about um, how much we're asking when we're putting a dog in a new environment with new people, new dogs, new new stimuli all over, et cetera, et cetera. I often tell dog owners, you know, it's kind of like when you send your kid to preschool the first day and they come home with some crayon drawing, you could look at that crayon drawing with your eyes closed, but you're still going to tell the kid that it's amazing because you just want the kid to feel good about being at school and it's not yet appropriate to be evaluating the drawing on the merit of, <laughs> on the on, on, you know, your child's talent as an artist. There's plenty of time for that later on, but first we want your kid to just be showing up to school and to be uh, happy to be there. And from my understanding of uh, attachment theory and attachment parenting specifically, that's kind of what it's all about. It's about creating a sense of safety and, and comfort for your child by giving them what they need rather than assuming that they are trying to manip manipulate you and that by tending to a child who's crying, for instance, you will be rewarding the behavior of crying and teaching them in the future that they should cry when they want something, that instead uh, it's more like you're just rewarding the behavior <laughs> of existing and whatever your child is doing in that moment, whether they're smiling or crying or screaming or whatever, you're still going to uh, give them what they need because the criteria of behavior that you're looking for is just zero, is just pure existence that when you're dealing with an infant, you can't really be expecting more than that, that they're just trying to survive and you need to do everything you can to help them rather than falling into the trap of thinking about the consequences of every little behavior. As I see it, like everything else, it all comes back to these two kinds of learning, learning by association, aka classical conditioning, and learning by consequence, aka operant conditioning. Both are happening all the time. But if there's ever a choice on which one to focus on in every situation, classical conditioning is always going to win because it's so it's so deep. It deals with how we are feeling about the world around us, what how our baby is feeling, how our puppy is feeling. And it's an uphill battle to teach your subject uh, the consequences of a behavior if your subject is not comfortable <laughs> to begin with just existing in the environment you have him in. And another way to think about what's being called attachment here is how many good associations your dog has with you or your child has with you or, or any any infant has with a caregiver. Every time you're feeding your dog, every time you're paying attention to your dog, every time you're you're doing anything for your dog that your dog likes, you're building like this bank account of of trust and love and you might say you're helping your dog feel attached to you in what I would say is a good way. And you're basically becoming a secondary reinforcer. So, you know, a primary reinforcer is something an animal needs, like food. You're, you don't need to learn to like food. You're just born knowing uh, <laughs> that food is interesting. Um, a secondary reinforcer is something that earns meaning, that we give meaning to. Like money is a secondary reinforcer. We're not born knowing about money, but we, we give it meaning over time because it's paired with so many things we want and need and love. And you, as a caregiver, become that kind of secondary reinforcer to the point where I think when you're in any kind of new situation with your dog, your dog thinks, okay, well, my human is here and I associate good things with my human, so this new place that we're in, this new person that I'm meeting, this new dog that I'm encountering, these must be okay things because I'm associating them now with my human as well. So anyway, I found all of this uh, interesting to learn about and to think about in terms of dog training and also as, as a new parent to think about in terms of my relationship with my daughter. I felt like when I was reading about attachment parenting, you know, oh gosh, these are kind of things I'm already doing. But the way I thought about it was um, less about this 
uh, word attachment and more about the associations I'm helping to create because, of course, I'm a dog trainer and I'm thinking about associations all the time. I want my daughter to feel nothing but good things about having me around. And uh, both because, you know, she has... Oh, that's that's her uh, giving, giving her two cents here. Um, that's because I'm the one who's going to be introducing her to so many things in the world. I'm going to be the one bringing her to new places and introducing her to new foods and this, that, and the other. So on the one hand, yes, of course, I feel like I want to meet her needs and I don't want to be giving her things on the basis of her behavior at this point because she's just like a little need machine and I want her to feel safe in the world. Um, but also I want her to feel good about me um, so that the f- good feelings about me can translate to all of these things that she is going to discover um, with me in her life. Woof shout out today goes to Alex, Chris, and Tiffany French, owners of Gilby and Ghost, because they really do such a great job of uh, making sure these dog best friends do get to hang out together. You can see their playdates on Instagram. Gilby is at, at Gilby Chris, that's Gilby and then K R I S S, and Ghost is at Ghost French. And fun dog fact of the day, I'm not sure if this is true, but I recently heard that the Beatles song, A Day in the Life, contains an ultrasonic whistle in it that Paul McCartney put in for the enjoyment of his Shetland sheepdog. So, if your dog is a Beatles fan, now you know why. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by telling your friends about it, leaving a review, or shopping in our online store. You can learn more about us and sign up to get lots of free training resources when you visit us online at schoolforthedogs.com. 